So again, welcome. I'm Deanna Canini, president of this extremely energetic organization. Thank you so much for coming to the third lecture of the season. I want to thank Butch and Joanne Murray for their generosity in sponsoring tonight's lecture. They are the owners of the Fastnet Pub, and so appropriate that they sponsor considering the proximity of the pub to the Cary Hill section of the board. Again, I want to thank all our dedicated and supportive members who gave to our annual appeal. We have raised over $25,000 from 194 members. Thank you. These funds will be used as the board engages in strategic planning to define a revised look to our interpretive center. We know we have important stories to tell of the Irish in Newport County and all their accomplishments and contributions. And I just want to give some notes of interest. The Bonnie Street Cemetery tours this fall, led by Steve Marino, were, were a big hit. Very intriguing mysteries were presented, and many who took the tours had some input in solving those mysteries. So you have to wait until next year and find out what those mysteries are. The Interpretive Center is now closed for the season. We had over 500 visitors. And if you haven't visited the center, please stop by maybe during March, during Irish Heritage Month, when we'll open with some limited hours. Excuse me. Plus, on Saturday, December 10th, from noon to 4.30, we have scheduled a Christmas open house at the center. Drop by and enjoy some goodies and maybe a few libations. And the Hibernian singers, men singers, will be performing at 3.30 to add to the festivities. And then also don't forget about our three walking tours of Irish Newport. They're self-guided and they take you throughout Newport and they're available on our website. Now, the highlight of the evening. We welcome back Dr. Kurt Schlichting. Better? Better. Okay. Kurt is not a stranger to the Museum of Newport Irish History. This is his sixth lecture. His first was in 2011. His topics have ranged from a discussion of the 1880 census, Irish immigration records, upward mobility of the Irish, Irish in Manhattan's neighborhoods, and the community at St. Mary's. Dr. Schlichting, Kurt, is a scholar, an author, a film personality, and a bit of a techie. He is a professor emeritus at Fairfield University in Connecticut, where he both studied and taught. Kurt is also a professor for Salve's Circle of Scholars program. Kurt is the author of books about New York's Grand Central Station and about Manhattan Waterfront. His film career included being an advisor and interviewee for the documentary about Grand Central Station. And in the tech arena, Kurt has done extensive work with geocoding that links digital maps and digital census data. I'm sure Kurt's topic will hit home as we saw from many people who have in the audience who have um, grown up either in the Cary section of town or someone in the family who's from that neighborhood. I know it'll be interesting. Please welcome Kurt to tonight's lecture, Ethnic Conflict. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, let me begin with uh, one thought I had I was going to share with you. I have a ridiculously German name, as you, you, you can see. And you might ask, well, why am I interested in the, the Irish in, in Newport? Well, it turns out that my mother was O'Connell and my grandparents were Tobin. And so um, they were apparently going to call me Kurt O'Connell Schlichting. And that would have been a mouthful, so they dropped that, and it's just Kurt Connell's short thing, as you'll see. Um, and there's my my grandmother, Tobin, and uh, my mother, O'Connell, and uh, my wife is Murphy. <laughs> so I, I have a, a, an Irish background. Um, what, what we're going to talk about tonight is the Irish in Newport, but I want to just give a brief overview of the Irish coming to America. Now, if you can see that chart, you can see that the during the famine years, there were, there were almost a million people who came during a period of time. But that Irish immigration continued for the rest of the 19th century. And the best estimate is that about 4.7 million Irish immigrants came to America. And I want you to keep that number in mind because I'm going to show you uh, some data about that later on. Well, this is a complicated story. You can tell this story in many, in many facets. You could 
There's novels that have been written about the Irish coming. There's been films about the Irish coming. Um, I remember going to the movies when I was a kid and there always would be a short before the, the movie you wanted to watch. And the, some of these shorts were the East Side Kids or the Gas House Kids. Do any of you remember seeing some of those shorts? And, you know, Muggsy was the leader of the gang and Alfalfa had the hair up here. And the policeman always what on the street was always Irish talking with a broke, you know, with a real Irish accent. Um, and then there's biography. We can read a biography of James Michael Curley, the legendary mayor of, um, of Boston, and um, a good biography of Joseph Kennedy. But also, this involves family stories and family memories. So next Thursday, or next, next Thursday after Thanksgiving, often there's someone in the family who tells the story. And we listen to those stories. And the question is always, well, what's, where's, where's fact and reality? I had a great aunt who did it all the time. And she would tell these stories that uh, grandma told me that grandma didn't get along. So every time she was pregnant, she went back to Ireland. But then she returned so the baby would be born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And an Irish citizen. So we'll, we, we'll talk some more about that. Well, what I've been doing uh, now for a, a period of time is, is really a revolution in how we can think about and do research about the, the immigrants coming in general. And we're going to look at some census data today. And the census data, and I'm going to show you a slide about that, had been preserved on microfilm. Now, do any of you remember, perhaps in college, going through the microfilm rate? And now you've got this roll of tape with thousands of, of pictures, and you've got to find your ancestor by, by sitting at the microfilm. That was, that was tedious. Well, there's a, a, a research center at the, at the University of Minnesota, which has worked diligently to put this data out in, on spreadsheets. And I'm going to show you some of that. And this has been funded by uh, the American government, the different um, branches of the Department of Education. And of course, this is also Ancestry.com. How many of you have uh, an Ancestry? So if you, some of you have used you know, Ancestry.com, and that's a fantastic portal to looking at historic census data. And then in addition to that, we can now look at historical maps. And I'm going to show you some historical maps of Newport. And they've all been scanned. You know, you're not opening the book with or unrolling the, the map itself. Um, it's it's been all been digitized. The Library of Congress has a terrific um, maps that you can download. So this is called the spatial turn. So we can look at um, a street uh, in in Cary Hill, Burnside Avenue, for example, and we can see who lived on the various in the various homes there. And that's somewhat different than if we go on Ancestry.com and we search for a relative and up comes the information about the relative, but who lived next door? Who lived down the street? How Irish was the neighborhood or was it a German neighborhood? And those neighborhoods are part of the story of immigration to America. So we're gonna do a little of that. And here's the, the, the process. So if you look at the left side of the screen, yes, the left side, that's a picture of a census taker collecting the census. And they had these folios that they walked around with. It had columns and rows, and they were instructed to ask someone in the household, who lives here, what's their name, how old are they, where were they born, and they would, write that information. And eventually it would go back to the Census Bureau in, in DC, and then they would then do a, basically an early statistical analysis of it and then publish that data. But the folios were in the National Archives. And 
you can see here, this is a page from the first census, the 1790 census, and it doesn't include very much information, but it's important because it, it, it looks at American society in 1790. And these were saved. And then eventually they started to microfilm the ledgers, page by page by page. And that's what we look at when we open ancestry.com. And then the Mormon church. The Mormon church has the best genealogical records in the, in, in the world. And there's a reason for that. If you were going to be a, a, a Latter-day Saint, you want to also have your ancestors to be a Latter-day Saint, and you need to know that. Well, they did that work, and then they started to, there, were, there was a volunteer effort that Mormon volunteers, men and women, would sit in their homes with the microfilm machine, and they'd be doing this, and they'd get a page, and then they'd read the names, and they'd enter the names on a spreadsheet. On a spreadsheet. Well, that then becomes a giant business, and Ancestry.com now has 30 billion records. The, the United States Census, the Ireland, the Irish Census, the English Census, census from all over the world, um, hospital records, and it's now all available online. And um, they sold that business last year for $4.7 billion to a hedge fund. And they also started to work with the, with the Minnesota Population Center, and that's been very, very fruitful. So here's a page from the microfilm, and this is Burnside Avenue, and this is the 1880 census. And you can see the, 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 the script, it's written in script. And sometimes it's nice and clear like this. Sometimes it's impossible to read. I don't know how they did it. And sometimes I just think they wrote a, a name down. But this is a, this is a, this is, there's four, there's three families here living on Burnside Avenue in 1880. The Cronin family, the Savage family, and the Welsh family. And Hannah is Daniel Cronin's wife, and Anne is John's, and Joanna is James. But what we can do here is when we look to the right, this is the first census that asked, where was the person born, where, were the, where was the father born, and where was the mother born? Now, when you look at this, in these three families, the parents came from Ireland. Both of them came from Ireland. And then their children are born in the United States, but their, their parents are born in Ireland, and that makes them first generation. And so you can then look at this all over the country. You can do this and see where, how large was the first generation, the immigrant generation, and then what about their children? And you can see here um, that, that that can be done by, by, by this, but I'm gonna show you this as, as spreadsheets. And you might notice that there's two columns there with checks in them. And those columns are, can, can you read? Could the person read? Could the person write? And if you look at the Cronin parents, neither of them could read or write. And a lot of people came to America, not just the Irish, but a lot of people came to America coming from a country that was poor and they couldn't read or they couldn't write. But their children can, right? Their children are going to learn how to read or write. And this is the, this is the corresponding spreadsheet. So if you look here, here's the people, and then this is from the spreadsheet. And this is, comes from the Minnesota Population Center. And then what you can do is you can really do a, a detailed analysis, and you can do it with programming. You're not going through this one by one by one by one. You write a program. So what they did here, for example, is you can see the occupation of the people on, on this particular this, these particular people on Burnside. And then what the, Senate, what the Minnesota Population Center does is said, well, all right, we're gonna make a code. Certain occupations have high scores, certain occupations have low scores. 
And that's a way of looking at the social structure of the people living on Burnside. And then the, the, the corresponding piece is, is to do what's called HGIS, historical GIS. And on the left-hand side here, this is a famous map of, of Newport. It's the Blaskowitz map. Blaskowitz was a, a British officer and a cartographer, and he drew a very detailed map of Newport. And I think many of you, you can buy this often in stores in Newport, and put it up on the wall because it's a famous map of, of Newport. And so now what's different here is it's turned to face the north. And then what we did is we take digital street maps and edit them back to the streets that were there in, in 1776. And that's the red map that you see there. And then you can put that on top of the historic map. And it fits perfectly, doesn't it? Because they were great photog photographers back then, and now we're doing it with, with, with the GPS monitors and, and that. So this fits, and then if you look at the upper right, I hope you can see this. I'm gonna put a little, little box around that. Those are the streets in the heart of Cary Hill. In fact, that street in the middle is, was, was Spruce Street, it's now Kingston. And this was a part of the, the city at this particular time. And eventually this land is owned by the city and they're called the school lands. And their plan was to sell the, 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 the property and use that money to, to build public schools. And you can do these types of maps in New York, you can do them um, everywhere because it's a, it's a technology. And, and by the way, how many of us use Google Maps? Well, you're doing GIS. That's what you're doing when you open your Google Map. And you can type in an address, can't you? Well, these, this, you can do that here as well with these maps. Well, now let's look at the Irish in Newport. And I just, for this particular slide, started in 1850. And you can see that people, the Irish people were coming to Newport continuously. And what, what's also important here is what's called chain migration. People often came to America, but, but someone had come before them, someone perhaps from the village or a relative. And then that drew some other, the other immigrants would follow that path. So my great-great-grandfather came from Germany and went to St. Louis. But then the next generation followed. And what I'm doing here is looking at both the Irish and the first gen. And so the percentages that you see on the right are the combination of the immigrant immigrants and their first, their first children. And the best estimate is that's 34% in, in, in 1880, but actually the percentage is higher because what it doesn't do is it doesn't pick up the third generation. That's not in the census data. They're not asking, well, where were the grandparents born? That would have been too complicated. But if, you, if, if, if a young person came here in the famine years and they're 15 years old, 10 years later, they're married, they have a child, that child would be um, the, uh, the, first, the second generation. And there were pieces to this chain migration. This is a picture of Fort Adams. And if you look at the, the, the on the right-hand side is a contract and it's John Quigley. And he came and he's working at, at building Fort Adams. And in the 1850 census, there were 148 people living in the, at the fort, and 27% of them were born in Ireland, and 20% were born in Germany. So this is the chain migration. When they finished their work, they might have stayed in Newport, started a family, become part of the community, perhaps moved to Cary Hill. 
And then the, the, the hotels, when Newport becomes the first major, um, first major resort in the United States, these giant hotels were built. And this is the Atlantic House in the corner of Bellevue and Pelham. And in the 1850 census, it lists the servants who live in the, in the, at the hotel. And if you look at the left-hand side, you can see the census records. I took a picture of that. And these are all young women from Ireland. And they came, there's a path, they were at the Atlantic House, they were working there for a period of time. Well, they might then have met a man, another Irishman, of course, and uh, started a family, and they would have, have not no longer worked as a servant in the Atlantic House. And you can see the spreadsheet on the right-hand side is the is the data and you can see the names are pretty um pretty then you can see their names and then who did they marry where do they live in newport how many children did they have these are the these are the questions that are fascinating they're really fascinating to think about and then in the 1880 census the gilded age is beginning in newport and Chateau Sumer on Bellevue Avenue has been built, and the census was taken. They were the census was taken during the summer, and it's a Wetmore family. But then, if you look down below, there's 15 servants living downstairs or backstairs, and if you look at the the ones at the bottom, they're 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 from Ireland. And then would they have stayed and, and done this for the rest of their lives, perhaps, but not necessarily. They could have at some point left the service and started a family here in Newport. This is part of the chain that brought people here to Newport. And then we need to think about ethnic enclaves because that's the way society becomes organized in the, certainly in the second half of the 19th century. And, but what's interesting about doing boundaries, it's, it's fuzzy, it's fuzzy. So if someone said, well, you know, I, I grew up in South Boston and Southie. Well, what streets, what streets do you, you have in your mind is, is the neighborhood. And that would be true of Greenwich Village, Federal Hill, Harlem, and here in Newport, the Fifth Ward, or the Point, or the Historic Hill, or certainly Cary Hill. How, where do the boundaries, what street should be the southern or eastern boundary? Well, we have one source, and this was a, a, a collection that was done in 1881 by St. Mary's Church and Father Grace. And they had debt to pay off, and Father Grace went off and started this great collection. And um, they published a magazine, a magazine, they published a, a pamphlet listing everybody's contribution. But Father Grace started with a couple of words of, um, I don't know, wisdom. He, was, um, he said, well, there's some problems here in the community. And we all know that, that it's, it's a struggle for some of the earliest immigrants to come here, it's a struggle. And then what he does, however, is he identifies 20 individual streets. And so what I did here on the right is to just put a, um, identify those streets. And by the, at this point in time, by the way, the Fifth Ward wasn't on Narragansett Avenue. There wasn't very much development there. It hadn't, hadn't started, and you can see Cary Hill up in the right. And this is a, these, these are pages from the, the pamphlet that uh, Father Grace published. And on the left-hand side, you can see the people who, who contributed the most. And then on the right-hand side, you can see two streets on Cary Hill, Calendar Avenue and part of Spruce Street. And if you look at the names there, you may recognize certainly an Irish name, and perhaps you had an ancestor who lived there. Well, Father Grace, if you didn't contribute, he listed what you should have contributed. 
And uh, so what, what we can do is then, um, I had a student do helping this uh, summer from Salve, Morgan, Morgan Lee, she was terrific. We were, she was working up at the Redwood Library. And what at one point she did was she took this, this page and then she went to the 1880 census and looked to see the, if the people on calendar, if, it, if there was a match. And that was really interesting. And then down at the, uh, on Spruce Street, you'll see a, a Patrick Halpin. And he contributed $30. $30 was a lot of money in 1881. It really was a lot of money. And um, so what we then did is we, we mapped out the Cary Hill neighborhood. And you can see that these maps are called insurance maps. And there's, this one is the uh, Richards maps from, um, published in 1893. And they're really detailed. Um, the company would do this because the insurance companies would purchase the maps because if you wanted an insurance policy, they wanted to know, well, who lives next door? Is it wood frame building or is it not? And so um, what we did then is we created a digital map of the streets in Cary Hill. And I've listed the streets there on the, on the right-hand side. And I know someone's gonna raise their hand and say, well, wait a minute now, what about Tilden? Or it's fuzzy. So this is our Cary Hill map. And uh, Spruce is now Spring Street and West Broadway was Tanner. That was the name of the street in the 1880 census. And then what we can do is we can take the digital data on, in spreadsheets and we can then do some really interesting statistical work. There's gonna be no quiz, no quiz. Um, and you can see that in Cary Hill, the, the, um, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the immigrants and then the firstborn are over 50% of the population. And I think that underestimates how Irish Cary Hill as a whole was. But when you look at um, Burnside and Calendar, here are two streets. You can see how many people were living on those streets, 252, 160, and everyone was Irish. So what you would have done if you walked down that street, you would have heard Gaelic. And there may be people who came and went to the Cary Hill neighborhood because they spoke Gaelic. And their English might not have been, they're, they're going to English, they're eventually going to speak English. So that's what the enclave does. It's a, it's a place of comforts. You know people, you feel comfortable on these streets. And we can follow that with this type of an analysis. And um, once again, this, this was, oh, I'm going backwards. Now, Cary Hill. There's also the individual family stories, aren't there? And this is a picture that's at the museum. And it's a picture of a grocery street on Tanner. And the art, the best to our best of knowledge, the gentleman standing with the, with the, with the hat is Patrick Halpin. But then if you go around the corner and you look at the, the census data for Spruce Street, there's Patrick Halpin. His, he's a, a grocer. Well, that's his grocery store. And you know, just, just remember, in 1880, there weren't many ice boxes anywhere, right? There was ice, but no ice box. So what you often had to do was when dinner, when dinner, you planned the dinner, and you went to the grocery store, you cut the meat, you brought it back, cooked the meat, you there's no way to store it. And this is true. So all the immigrant neighborhoods often had grocery stores everywhere because that's how. Um, people got by. And then, but you can see who else lives there, but his next door neighbors and his wife's next door neighbors. And then if you zoom in on this particular map, this is Bruce Street, and you see Ellen Halpin, because she owned the property and she's on the property records at City Hall. 
So if we wanted to do a road trip tomorrow, we could go down to City Hall, we could find the, the property records for 1880. And if we would looked up that number, I can't read the number from here, it's 4653, I think. That's the property. And so here's, here we have a link, don't we? We've got a story about Patrick Halpin and his wife, Ellen. And here's their pictures. And um, in 2018, we had what we called a, a crowdsourcing event over at Salve University. And people came from the museum, sat with the students, the student had a computer, and they looked up their, their relatives. And Patrick Halpin would have been there. And Carla Francis, who's a member of the museum, lives in Middletown. She's a descendant of, of the Halpins. So we're connecting a big picture of data, but we're connecting it to people, the people who, who live there. And uh, this continues. We've, we've done this kind of work with the 1900 census and the 1910 census. And you can see some changes occurring in the, in the Kerry Hill neighborhood. And on the right-hand side, what we've done is we've geocoded the, the, uh, the address of a household to a particular street, to a particular part of the street. And then we can see who different people there were. African Americans lived in parts of Cary Hill. And you can see where they live, and you can see where um, the Irish lived. And then I found this map, <laughs> and I've got a question for you all. This is another map. This is the Sanborn Company with these maps. And this is an 1891 map of a pond. And you'll notice I added pond to this particular table here, and there were Irish there, there were African Americans there as well. And then this detailed map of Pond Avenue, it, it shows the Newport Laundry Company. And I went off and looked in different sources, and I couldn't find anything about the Newport uh, Laundry Company. But if, if you look at that red the part of it, it's the, the, the housing there is labeled tenements. And that, what, I, what I think that means is that the, the company owned that, those buildings and they rented them to the people working at the laundry. And they're not very big. There's a lot of them. And that would have been, that's not unusual. There were three cotton mills on Fame Street at this particular time and uh, they had housing as well. So this is an interesting part of the, ele the evolution of Cary Hill. And then here's the, um, this is the Burnside Avenue in the 1910 census. And you can see how many children they had. And you can look to see who lived next door to whom. And that's, an often, that's often an interesting dynamic, isn't it? And then we can take a look. There's another way of exploring this. Is we can take a look at a particular building. So 54 Calendar Street. And you can see that building in 1880, who's living there. It's a two-story building. You can see who's living there in 1900. And then you can see who's living there in 1910. That's a way of thinking about this. So I would used to take my students to Greenwich Village, um, and we'd walk on a particular street, and they had looked up a particular building, and they had the information who was living there in 1880. And it was a block from um, the Hudson River, and they were Irish longshoremen families. That's what they did. That's what they did. And then um, I'd ask them before the, the trip to go to Zillow and see what the building's worth now. Well, this is a brownstone in the Greenwich Village, and they're five million dollars. However, however, here's a picture of of, of um, Calendar Avenue today, and this is 54 Calendar. Well, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? 
That's because it's for sale. And if you haven't brought your checkbook with you, you can go tomorrow and you can buy this for $900,000, close to $900,000. That's another story. That's gentrification. So think of the arc of this. The, 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 the immigrants come here and they live on, in Cary Hill and they're, some of them are very poor. They're struggling. They, they're going to invest in their children and their family and are eventually going to have upward mobility. But what's happened to many parts of the, the least expensive parts of Newport is this gentrification. And uh, we took a ride down that street and across the street from this, they're gutting a house. It's a wood frame house. They, the, the, the builder was there. They're gutting it. They're going to turn it into a uh, very upscale um, housing. And then there's a, another issue here, and that's leaving the enclave. And uh, Steve Marino refers to this, and I think other people do, called Crossing Broadway. So if you were living in, in Cary Hill and you were ambitious and you worked hard and you, you might want to leave that particular neighborhood and cross Broadway. Now, it could be to leave Cary Hill and go to the Fifth Ward. That could have been part of that process. And um, this is the Donovan family. And they lived on... Um, Warner, 78 Warner Street. And you'll notice there were a, a number of children. There were seven children, but see, there's a John. Keep John in mind. Well, in 1900, John Donovan is still there in, at 78 Warner Street. But some of the children aren't. So the question is, well, where did the children go? And it turns out that in 1910, John Donovan is now 36 years old. He's moved to Webster. And notice, he's a, he's a machinist, and his next door neighbor who has Donovan, same last name, I don't know if they were related, but he's a, he's a plumber. And those, those were skilled trades. And you earn much more money than you would have of being a laborer over on Warner Street. And um, so these are, the, these are the contemporary pictures of 78 Warner and 27 Webster. But Webster was a single family home. That wasn't the case at 78 Webster. So the, character, so the organization of the Fifth Ward was space, more spacious, it's not walking down Burnside or Calendar. And it's, it's, this, it's this issue of, um, of following the Irish over time. And you might have noticed that in 1940, when you look at born in Ireland plus children born in Ireland, it's only 6%. But look, by this period of time, there's a third generation in many families there's a fourth generation, there's a fifth generation, because the families have been here for a long period of time. So it underestimates dramatically the Irishness of certainly Cary Hill and all of, all of Newport. And leaving Broadway, um, well, this is, this is something that we'll hear next week, perhaps, at the dinner table, but you know, we, we, we can read the novels, we can look at the uh, movies. This is a famous movie, Goodwill Hunting. And how many of you have seen Goodwill Hunting? You know, there's two scenes here. It's the Southie kids and, and the Harvard guys, and they're going to have a fight in a bar, right? And the Harvard guys are putting them down because they're not educated, and they know it. But there's, there's Matt Damon, who's a genius. And then this, that's a scene here is called Best of... Best day of my life when Ben Affleck says to uh, to uh, to Matt Damon, "I'm here for the rest of my life. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to work construction for the rest of my life, and my kids are going to go to, uh, to go to Little League in South. But you, you can leave." 
And, and then he says, that will be the best day of my life. And eventually, Damon leaves. He goes, chases the girl who's going to Harvard. She's going out to Stanford for medical school. So it's this, it's this tension of leaving the enclave. And there's another piece here, and I've, I've, done, I've done work on this. Another part of the, the, the community here in Newport is the institutional structure that the, the church brought us, right? So you imagine you build three Catholic churches, each of which has a grammar school. And then you have institutions that support people. And we had at this particular time, this is 1940 census, there were over 100 nuns and priests. And many of us, I'll raise my hand, went to a, a Catholic grammar school, a Catholic high school, and I went to Fairfield University. So, um, but, but this structure helps to define the community. And they're, they're still vibrant churches. And they, they encompass um, the, they, they, they help to build the sense of Irishness in Newport and obviously in Cary Hill. And so does the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and of course, this museum. This museum is a, what we call a local history museum focused on it, but it's very serious about looking at the history of the Irish and certainly Cary Hill and in Newport. And then there's ways of looking at change over time. And uh, by 1940, you can see that a high proportion of the Irish in, um, in Newport had um, moved up the occupational scale. And then the 1940 census is the first census that asks, what's the income of the household? Now, these maps that you see, I downloaded this from the Library of Congress, and these are called enumeration districts. That's how they did the census. A census taker walked door to door to door inside an enumeration district. And there's two there that really kind of split Kerry Hill in the middle, 27 and 34, and then for the fifth ward, it's 45 and 47. And the data is available. We've downloaded the 1940 census. And then we ask the question, well, what's the average income in census enumeration district 34 and 27 in Cary Hill? And how does that compare to the fifth ward? Well, there's a dramatic difference. The average income in Newport in 1940, household income was $1,000. But you can see that there's a really significant difference between those, those incomes in Cary Hill and the incomes in the Fifth Ward. So we're seeing here upward mobility, aren't we? We really are. And then I want to talk about modern times. What the Census Bureau did, it's a very complicated story. In 1980, uh, there was a movement to say, wait a minute, we have to have a measure of ethnicity. So they came up with this question, and this is the one we, we, we answered last, not last summer, but in 2020, when the census came, if you got the long form, you would have answered this question. You could have done it online. What is this person's answer? What is your ancestry? So I want to ask you, how many of you would, would have put Irish first? Right? How about Irish second? Some would. And then, of course, some of my students would, would write five or six of these, right? Because that's how complicated we've come over time. In 1980, approximately 40 million people across the United States answered Irish first or Irish second. And the population then was 220 million. So that's 18%. 18%. However, uh, the demographers had a field day with this, and this is an, an article that was published in, a, in, a, in an academic journal, how 44.7 million Irish immigrants became 40 million Irish Americans. 
Well, if what they said was it's, it's, it was complicated. They said that you know they had they had estimates of uh, fertility for each generation. So if all they all came and they all married only Irish people, then the next generation would be X. And then let's see. Well, all right. Then what we'll, we'll assume every one of them marries someone who, who's Irish, and we'll continue this on until 1980. And um, they no, I think it was 27. The best estimate was 27. So ethnicity is complicated, isn't it? it? It's a complicated construct in our heads, but it's sustained by that institutional, the, the institutional structure. This museum, the Hibernians, the Catholic parishes in, in Newport and in Middletown. Well, here's the answer to the question here. In 1990, 24, 34% of the people living in Newport said they were Irish. And that went down some by 2017. But Boston, Boston, <laughs> very few people said they were Irish. And then there's a way of doing this. This is, again, um, Census Bureau stuff. So what the census does is they now don't do enumeration districts. They do what are called census tracts. And there's 73,000 of them across the country. Everybody lives in a census tract. I know how anxious you're going to be to find out your Census Bureau tract number. But in Newport, one tract was 36%, and in Middletown, one was 31%. And that puts those two census tracts at the top 1% of the 73,306 census tracts across the country. So there really is an Irishness here that's, that people have in their heads. And then one, um, we also can look at this a very different way. And this is the, the, the upward mobility story. It's complicated, but what the Census Bureau does is they take these these four city towns in Newport, new city and town. And then what you can do, this is pretty nerdy, you can download um, the actual census answers, but they're totally anonymous. But you can then look and say, well, all right, uh, among these 53,000 people, how many of them said they were Irish? And it turns out to be, um, 12.4%. Uh, um, and then, 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 then what we did is we just took that and said, all right, let's see what the, the average household income is among these different ethnic groups. And uh, it turns out that the Irish have the highest average. These are the people who said they were Irish. Now, you know, sometimes people, when they get that particular census question, they say, I'm an American, right? But this is, a, this is in fact, um, a, a pattern where the Irish are now today in America, some of the um, wealthiest people, obviously wealthiest people, but people who have succeeded in upward mobility, right? And, you know, we, have, we, all, owe a we all owe a debt of gratitude to those nuns and priests. As, as tough as they were, but they, we all got an education there, didn't we? No? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here, but I want to tell a story. I'm going to tell a personal story here. Um, I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and so was my grandmother, and the family lived over on the east side on, um, as you can see, and my grandmother uh, went to St. Charles Parish, and she was very proud of her eighth grade diploma, which she kept up in her kitchen. Right, that was that was a you know to get a to, to get a even an, even a um, an eighth grade education was important. That was a way of upward mobility, and then they moved to the to the West End. And uh, 
My grandmother once said to me, one, it might have been on St. Patrick's Day, I crossed the river and I never went back. And I thought, well, you know, what's the Connecticut River? The Hudson River? Maybe the Mississippi River? If you, if you know Bridgeport, it's the Quantic River that snakes through the middle of the city. And um, she, she was serious because it, it, that meant upward mobility. Right? They all worked in the factories as young women, and then they moved to 177 Lenox Avenue. My mother goes to high school. She's on the tennis team and the swim team. And then she goes to Barnard and gets, um, they had a, 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 a dental hygienist program, a two year program. She did that. Father comes back from the war. He goes, finishes his engineering degree at UConn. And we moved to Fairfield, Connecticut. But we're, we're not on Lenox Avenue anymore. And we're not on the east side of Bridgeport anymore. And that's crossing, that's crossing Broadway. Then my father comes home one day and says, to, we're going to the Philippines. He was an engineer with Singer Sewing Machine. And we did. That, that's a pretty big Broadway, the, the Pacific Ocean. So, um, well, thank you, but I just, I just want, want, want to do one other thing here. I want to uh, once again do a shout out for um, the, the Fastnet Pub. We can go there on Sunday nights and listen to great Irish, Irish music, but you can also go there on the weekend and watch international sports. And if you're, if you're a soccer fan, you can watch the soccer. I'm a big fan of the rugby. And two, two Saturdays ago, I went down and watched Ireland play South Africa, and they won. And they're now ranked the best rugby team in the world. And next year is going to be the uh, the uh, the world the world <clears throat> uh, the world competition, and Ireland will do well, we hope. And, but you can go down the fast net and watch. It. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, are there any questions people would like to ask? We, we're here. If we can, if you do want to ask a question, we'll hope to get the mic for you. Yes. Why was it called Kerry Hill? Did most of the people come from County Kerry? Well, apparently that was that was an argument. That was there. Yes, that would be there. And it, and it becomes, so that becomes a neighborhood. And Steve Marino sent me a couple of clippings from the uh, Newport Mercury. And there were stories about Kerry Hill. Some weren't good. Some were good. But yes, it was that people were from Kerry. Yes. Thank you much for your sins, my grandfather. And I was informed the name Thomas Pat Kevin Wynn is a fairly common name in the meeting for Ross Tom, but I also found it way out in Whitehaven, um, in the Belfast area. Yeah, so this is a question about how do we, you know, there's there's names, Murphy, that's a common name. How do you how do you find people over time? Um, the Minnesota Population Center has these programs called cross tracking, and if any of you, I'm sure many of you know Patrick Murphy. He's done all that work with the marriage and birth records at St. Mary's. That's another way, but it is difficult. It's hard. And I went over, I went over a couple of years ago, I was at uh, University College Dublin, the Irish University, and was talking with people at a small conference, and it's hard even for them. And what they would like to be able to do is to be able to provide more information about the people who left and where did they leave from. Um, I have a database, it's a, you know, a National Archive database, has about 570,000 records of people coming across on the ships, starting in the famine years. 
But the information is, they, the, the ships were supposed to collect information that said, where is this person from, i.e. somewhere in Ireland, and where are they going in the United States? Most. Some went to Boston, most went to New York. Um, and they most left from Liverpool. So sometimes when you look at the census records, you'll see um, born in Ireland, then you'll see the children, the first two children perhaps, is, are England, and then um, the United States. And that's because there was a huge uh, Irish population in Liverpool. And then they, that some of them had to work hard in Liverpool to do terrible work to get enough money to get on the boat to come to America. Yes. Yes. So the the um, the, the just the the, uh, the information that just was here is that um, a lot of the Irish went first to Canada because the ships didn't it, they were they were cheaper and the the the, 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 the that was those were the coffin ships and there's an island just south of Quebec I think or. Um, and it's where thousands of, of them died because they were they they were on the ships and they had typhoid. And if they, by the way, if they died on the passage over, they just put took, put the put the bodies over the side. And it would said, and if you look at the census, you know the, the uh, manifest, it says died. And uh, that's another story, Father. Uh, the question is. Uh all these cities and towns in Rhode Island. Uh, in 1846, there were 560 Irishmen registered in St. Joseph's Parish, which is now St. Mary's Parish. Right. Uh, what rescued Newport from the doldrums, economic doldrums, was you said the building of the hotels. Yes. yes. There's the great hotels that were built here in the 1850s. So the bulk of the Irish population comes late in the 1850s into the 60s. Uh, that's different from the rest of the state. In the rest of the state, you get 15 to 20,000 Irishmen coming into the industrial villages and cities of northern Rhode Island, uh, as opposed to a few hundred coming to Newport. Yes, this is about the, the Irish coming. To, to, to the Irish working in the hotels and then the mansions as well. And then there was, there was good communication between New York and Newport because the steamships came up the Sound, uh, Fall River Line is one, one example of that. And uh, that provided uh, a passage, a way to get here to Newport. They often, they often couldn't afford to have a cabin so, so they, they would sleep out, sleep, sleep on the deck, deck. but, but they, they wanted, wanted to get to Newport. To Newport. Yes. And well, thank you for a great talk. I'm not Irish as far as I know, but for the past 27 years, my family and I have lived in the James Murphy house on Burnside Avenue. So we found this really interesting. And my question is whether you found much evidence of ethnic community institutions, such as mutual aid societies, union halls, bars in the neighborhood. Um, yeah, I, th I think there, I think there, there are those institutional <clears throat> I'm doing some work um, on um, New York City, and it's a complicated. It's not a complicated pro uh, project, but what happened in the in the in the famine years that the the, the Irish came were poor, and then they were destitute, and they had difficulty with their children. They would abandon the children at case, or uh, a child would get arrested for stealing some candy. And he would have to go before a local magistrate. And then the argument was to take those children out of their families. 
because the the the, 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 the prevailing argument was that families were, were, were failures and that the, the children would be destitute. And along comes then, it's a complicated story, but these, these nuns, the Sisters of uh, Charity, built these giant asylums in New York City. And I looked at some of the census records and there's page after page after page of children who were three months old, one year old, two years old, and they're in these asylums. And the nuns took care of them. Um, but it's heartbreaking to see those pages, page after page after page after page, and they're living in an, in an asylum. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, you might have all been to St. Uh, if you go to New York, you might have gone to St. Patrick's Cathedral. The entire block just north across the street was an asylum. That was the Catholic asylum. And uh, thousands of, of children were there. And the irony is, across the street were the Vanderbilts on Fifth Avenue. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you all for coming. And please stay um, and have some cheese and crackers and. and Talk to Kurt if you'd like to. Thank you very much. <laughs>